Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're, we're really delighted to be sharing this journey together and stoked that uh, each of you decided to make time for this and explore um, being involved, plugging in and out as works for your schedules. Um, uh, Marco, uh, at some point during this call, we'll do another review or a check-in with um, logistics in case anyone's having any troubles. But, you know, if you made it this far, we take it Zoom is reasonably working for you. And if there are three of you on the same uh, Wi-Fi or internet account, apparently your bandwidth is working for you. Um, so, uh, so we'll leave maybe logistics for, for follow-up towards the end. But um, welcome to the Shantaram Reader's Circle. Uh, I know that um, right away from the outset, it was actually the second book. I've got something in common with Paul. I've been savoring getting into that one. And I thought before I just cracked that open, I was going to give Shantaram another official read. And then one thing led to another. I kind of put out on Facebook whether or not people were interested. Um, Marco, a good friend of mine here in this area um, uh, with an incredible history that serves exactly this kind of online discussion, checked in to see if maybe rather than struggling with Google Plus communities and, um, and all, all kinds of other lesser systems, if we wanted to use the beautiful system he's been looking at for online learning and online discussions, et cetera. So one thing led to another, and here we are collaborating uh, with the incredible grace and you know, sort of leveraging years of work on, uh, from Marco and, and, and this beautiful online system. So um, that's sort of, you know, from a logistical standpoint, you know, the highest level welcome. and then. Maybe I'll hand it to you for a second, Marco, and then maybe you and I will both do a, a lead in on why this book is meaningful for us and then transition to opening it up. Okay. Well, I guess, first of all, I'm really glad to see everybody. Uh, when, whenever I do something like this, and not that I have, I don't have decades of experience. I mean, this is a, a couple of years of, of experimenting and uh, I'm not necessarily sort of the architect of a very elegant system. Like, I, like we were saying before, I kind of see under the hood and see all the, you know, the ways that uh, this, whatever you want to call it, this group or this platform, um, you know, can evolve, can be, can be better, can make it easier to have the kinds of conversations that I want to have and that I think others, you know, want, want to have as well, which in my mind are conversations that allow us to go deeper than I think sometimes we tend to be able to go in our day-to-day -day life because we're preoccupied with a million different things. Uh, as you, yeah, I'm in the same boat as you, David, with, uh, with the family and the house and the bills and uh, everything else that you know, needs to be taken care of on just the level of uh, practical day-to-day -day life. Uh, the, 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 gr the great catastrophe, <laughs> I, think, I think it's been called. Uh, and so to have a space where uh, you can go deeper into um, a reflection or a consideration or a meditation or a fantasy or the space of imagination and to dwell there for some time and then to be able to connect with others who are tapping into that same frequency. And every book is kind of its own frequency and tells its own, you know, opens, is a portal to its own world. Um, I find that to be very nourishing and I find that to be of, um, it's been of great value to me to the point that uh, I, you know, stopped doing everything else that I was doing in my life and, you know, tried, decided to take a different path and decided that I wanted to actually dedicate my life in some significant degree to creating spaces for having conversations like, like this and um, like, like we've been having on books and um, topics and matters in art and literature and philosophy and in um, and just being a human being, actually, I mean, because that's all that those things are really about. They're like ways of looking at and ways of um, processing and parsing like what it means to be alive. And, and I think certainly with a book like Shantaram, that is very strongly the theme. Like that's very strongly the, the, um, the crux of the book is life and death. Is, and, you know, this man is escaping from a, uh, I don't want to get too far into the book right now, but I mean, part of the reason that I was attracted to it is that it really is coming from that level. And I feel that that's just fundamental to who we are. Uh, and we don't share about it enough. We don't really kind of have a, even sometimes a language uh, for, for talking about it. But that's what literature is about. It's about providing us with languages, um, with narratives, with um, images 
with like so like such good literature lets you taste it lets you kind of see it even though it's not there it connects you across the world like this you know warp drive or this kind of hypersphere um and so so that's why that's why we're here and um and uh there's so much more I want to say about it, but I, 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 uh, I will leave it to you. You know, I'll pass it back to you. And I want to hear who's here with us. Uh, I think that this interpersonal, this intersubjective dimension of reading is really, really interesting. Uh, and um, it gives us kind of a mirror for ourselves. Uh, and we become mirrors for each other. And even like the Zoom interface kind of does that because you get to see this Brady Bunch thing where you're like one in... Uh, like in in, a, in, a, in this case, in a grid of um, uh, of others, uh, and um, what's interesting too that I've found about even this, this online space is that it creates this kind of very um, it creates a different kind of intimacy because you're kind of in my head and we're kind of in each other's spaces. Like we're all kind of intermingling in this interface, and it really is an interface. So like we're facing each other. Uh, but then we have this book as a context uh, to um, to share with one another, to share that space and to define what that space is and where it can go. So um, that's sort of like my desire, my intention, or like what's sort of behind uh, me doing this. And um, and yeah, I'm very interested to. Well, I know some of you. I don't know others, and I'm you know quite interested to just see like what happens. That's perfect. So let's, um, so let me, uh, we'll go around the circle and then I'll close the circle. So um, Marco just opened it up and on my screen, I'll just kind of call it out this way, you know, Rebecca, if you'd be willing, the invitation, um, if it helps to structure it all, it'd just be whatever introduction feels, um, feels nice to, to give the group on who you are, or where you're calling in from, what's, you know, generally what's happening, you know, in your world. Um, and then just what, what attracted you to Shantaram itself and Shantaram uh, being part of a Shantaram reading and discussion circle? Okay. Um, I live in LA and uh, I have an escape plan that is enacted in a year. <laughs> so I'm really excited about that. Um, and it's funny when you, I, I think we're friends on Facebook, David, and um, this came up and I thought Shantaram gosh I read that oh I don't know I don't even know when it came out originally but it was somewhere around the time when it originally came out and I very rarely revisit a book especially one that's as heavy as that book I mean like weight wise actually um but I thought it it makes a lot of sense to read it before I read the second um uh, and um, and then this idea of the book club came up and I, I don't have a lot of spiritual friends here. Um, and I think it's, and I work at home alone. So it's kind of like this opportunity for me to have once a, excuse me, once a week or even, um, more than that, this sort of forum for talking about deep, interesting things, um, I think what I've noticed about my previous reading of the book and my reading now is I've, I was very much in the beginning of my spiritual journey when I would have read that book. I can't even think of when it was, but um, to have come where I am now, it, it's a very different reading of it. And it's, I'm finding it um, so deep and so, profound the way he's written this book and um the content of it and i can hardly wait for the second one but i'm going to wait because i think um let's focus on this for now so that's about it i'm just super excited to be here and uh feel like making new friends that have common interests and anyway that's it and I have a cool phone. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say I appreciate the gesture of self-sacrifice to hold off on the on the book you really want to read to come back and to read the first one. There's some, yeah. some there's some spiritual discipline in that, I think. <laughs> oh, disciplined I am. <laughs> that is one thing you can say. Yes. <laughs> I do have discipline. So yeah, I am waiting. But um and I have thoroughly loved rereading Chandaram, so 
it's not like it's hard hard work it's awesome that's beautiful thank you it's beautiful so rather than me playing the you know duck duck gray duck and picking whoever feels uh, ready to go next paul pam jamie dasha feel free to just uh, chirp up well since you need me first i'll go <laughs> Paul Bogle, and I'm in um, Walnut Creek, which is in the East Bay Area, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. And I actually live in Pleasant Hill, but I'm here in my office in Walnut Creek today. Um, see, I found the group, this particular group, the email. I had uh, taken note of the infinite conversations around um, uh, Gebser's book, um, of Origin. Um, and didn't participate um, in that one, unfortunately. I, life kind of took me in a different direction. But I have a, a close friend who's a psychotherapist and an editor and facilitates um, family constellations and is a top-notch professional comedian. And uh, she said I should read uh, this book. Actually, she gave me Mountain Shadow, the sequel, but said I should read um, Shantaram first, so I went to the library and then got an email the next day about this particular reading group. So I'm just trusting in the synchronicity of it all and uh, considering it a meant to be phenomenon. And so here I am. Well, it's an honor, Paul. So glad and really nice to meet you and look forward to sharing this journey with you. Likewise. Well, I'll go next. My name is Pam. And um, I live in southern Utah, amongst the Red Rock. Uh, and um, I've stopped reading novels or, or books for the most part since uh, the internet and computers and all the rest of that. You know, and I used to read, I was a bookworm growing up, read all the time. And, um, and I've sort of lost that I rarely read anymore. So one of my impetus was just to sort of refocus on that um and and then when um you know we interviewed marco for the we did a summit spiritual technologies 2.0 summit and he uh it, during the interview you know he talked about it and i was kind of captivated by the story and and even hearing the first part of it that you know is taking place in bombay like i know nothing about india really and haven't had any call to go to india so i sort of was also this is also sort of a disruptive thing for me too, uh, just sort of to break out of my my patterns, that kind of thing. I also work at home, um, on a computer all the time, on Zoom and Skype all the time, um, which I love. You know, I love being able to connect to people that way. But I've never, I don't think I've ever been part of a reading group before. So anyway, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to doing this with y'all. Hey everybody, I guess I'll go next. Um, I'm Jamie. I am David and Dasha's nanny. Um, so for me, uh, also like you, Pam, I had never been part of a reading group. And also I read a lot of like business books. I don't read, read a lot of novels. So I'm just kind of starving for that kind of intellect and connection. So, you know, David had told me about it and I was like, oh, perfect so many things that him and Dasha have told me about are like right on my checklist of stuff <laughs> stuff that I wanted to do and mm. this is definitely one of them is to get more involved in like reading groups and just uh you know bouncing ideas off and thoughts off other people so I'm really happy to be part of it yeah I think I'm the last yeah. one here I've been uh, postponing a little bit because I might have some background noises uh, <laughs> uh, also, I'm really excited to be a part of the group and uh, I've uh, definitely resonated with a lot of uh, what uh, others have shared. Uh, I grew up reading a lot of books before the age of internet or just at the tail end of the age with no internet. <laughs> and um, I, I used to read a lot and I, as I got a little older, got a little more in, um, absorbed in life and um, uh, started reading a lot less. So it's, it was really great. Uh, like Shandaram was one of the, um, 
like at that time, not reading a lot, but that, that was one, a wonderful uh, revival of the reading habit. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed the book. Actually, David might not remember this, but I recommended the book to him. And um, I uh, learned it from a psychologist in Russia who my mom was following very closely. And he kept, he's introducing some quite revolutionary ideas there um, on child rearing. And um, I mean, they're revolutionary for the post-Soviet Union area, not so much for more developed world. But um, uh, part of the, that philosophy, like Sundaram would fall very closely into that philosophy. And um, um, so he recommended the book. And when I was re looking for the next cool thing to read, I started listening to the Russian audiobook and then I thought I could do the original and then I thought David would really enjoy this <laughs> and uh, we continued on together and uh, it's been a great journey I'm glad we're going back to it David has gone over it again and again so many times since then which is amazing yeah and it's great to read it again and go back to some of the scenes and the writing that's in the book yeah thanks everyone Cool, cool, cool. So, um, so for me, um, there is the obvious um, inroad to being interested in this story from um, how formative India was for me. I um, I went away to India. I skipped the States as quickly as possible after high school. I mean, thank God they didn't have Ritalin or would have never discovered uh, love of this planet as basically my way of uh, overcoming the restlessness in those little public public school desks and, you know, stare at the blackboard and all the uh, parent-teacher conference reports where, well, you know, he's, he's a lot of fun during conversation and film strips, but he just doesn't, he doesn't take tests well and... <laughs> what have you. So I was lucky to have parents that let me uh, sort of dream my dreams and identify myself uh, um, not so much by whether I was able to sit still and focus, by, but by the adventures I would surely um, take on once I was set free. So I set myself free with a secret little savings from a few years of summer work by buying a one-way ticket to Europe, uh, you know, after high school. And, um, you know, love of travel um, and a love of... Um, sort of eastern philosophy and you know so i was primed to i was primed to uh get to india as soon as possible um even during high school uh ram das and a lot of the east were eastern wisdom leaning uh tail end of you know psychedelic 60s and 70s was was deep reading deep and important reading for me so um i made it to india in my very early 20s and it was um it was a you know an unspeakably formative um, experience, and so uh, reading Shantaram uh, was was an incredible unpacking. I didn't realize I had this whole experiential lexicon, uh, memories of smells and the way light trickles through certain trees and jacarandas with in misty mornings with chai cooking in in the streets and you know so. Um, it, it, reading the book was a, an incredible gift from this author back to the part of me, you know, we talk about leaving our heart places. And I, I don't think really the tempo of my, my um, living in the first couple decades of my life left me much time for introspection and reflection and the unpacking of memory. It was pretty much Pretty much, you know, Aries, uh, you know, horns forward, adventure on. And so this was a, a really welcome pause. And I think it it, it marked um, in its capacity to sort of sit me down and get me remembering and owning and daring to feel um, um, what India had meant to me. It marked a, a real um, recalibration of sort of the the boyhood momentum of being an adventurer into sort of the beginning of, um, of, I don't know, I guess, you know, the, the gifts of, of middle age, you know, the gifts of starting to come into periods where reflection and meaning making adds an important layer of, of value. And it wasn't just pure hedonistic, you know, um, you know, diving forward into each new un 
unexplored land and, and culture and, and language domain, et cetera. So um, I think among everything else that I can say or that will, that I'll get a chance to say, you know, as we share further groups coming up, I think that would be the hallmark for me um, of uh, the gratitude I feel for this work in terms of how it has provided an invitation to, um, to reflect, reclaim, um, sort of welcome into the here and now, the um, the nutritive power of memory, and um, so there's a kind of a an integration across time, for me across my various ages. And India is so seminal, and his journey, which I'll talk more about later for myself, also uh, is incredibly um, uh, provocative and cathartic and relevant as well. So, yeah. I think it's interesting that Dasha uh, suggested the book to you uh, at the outset. It reminds me of a line on the first page. Uh, so it begins this story, like everything else, with a woman, a city, and a little bit of luck. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> Except this isn't about Moscow. That's a different <laughs> book. And I'm only a little way through writing it, so please. Don't <laughs> so I, I'm curious. Uh, I've never been to India uh, myself, like Pam. I, I have had a, a formative experience in another culture, uh, and that was in Nicaragua in my case. And so some of the uh, experiences or some of the qualities that, uh, that Greg, uh, Dave Gregory, Gregory Roberts reports, I, I relate to not on the concrete level of um, you know, the city of, of Bombay itself, but kind of from the level of like being a foreigner. In, in a place that in some ways is, um, it's one way he put it, it's, it's freer. Uh, and it's more, it's realer. It feels realer anyway. Yeah. And, uh, and in some way, because you're a foreigner, you have to, like, you have to be accepted into it, like to really know it. And one of the themes, at least in this, these first hundred pages seems to be like this, like his escape one, but that hap- that's in the backstory, but he lands in, in Bombay and he's an outsider. Uh, and he, ha- he has to kind of decide at some point. Like one of the things is deciding whether or not he's going to stay and what staying will require of him. Uh, and so I- I'd be curious to know just how people relate to that theme and, um, and even just concretely, like where they're at with respect to the place. Like, you know, I'm, never been in india so it's totally foreign uh to me i'm imagining it that video was really useful uh that on on the, that i posted on the forum uh the streets of shantaram um but something about foreign being a foreigner something about being accepted in a different place amongst others and what that really means to be accepted seems to be one of the important themes here and you know uh it reminds me, I, when I was about 22, um, I went to Israel, and I spent a month working on a kibbutz there. And, um, and I relate to it in a similar way. There was sort of a, you know, on the kibbutz, if you worked hard, that was one of the ways you began to be accepted. If you were lazy, not so much, because work was an important cultural thing there. And then eventually they began to invite me into their mini homes. It was a very, uh, it was a communist kind of kibbutz. You know, all the kids were raised together from about six months on. Um, and it was very different. But, but Mark, as you were speaking, I was realizing that was one place where I began to have that sense of being uh, welcomed in at a deeper level. In part because because I was so interested, you know, we talked one of the older guys and uh, uh, starting to teach us Hebrew, and um, yeah, it was I I loved it. And on the kibbutz, there's lots of volunteers that come through, so there's people coming through from all over the world too. Uh, but I, I from that point on, you know, I realized that I really like to stay in a place for at least a month long or longer. This sort of hopping from place to place doesn't doesn't allow for that sense of connection and richness that begins to happen when you stay in one place for a while. I haven't thought about that in a long time, but yeah. Yeah, I'm really glad that you kind of brought up that question and thinking about that because uh, in the future, 
probably a little bit over a year from now, I plan on doing a pretty big like world trip. And it's just really interesting um, reading the book and how he really works his way in to um, get closer, you know, with the locals. And that's really what I want. I don't want it from a tourist perspective. I want to really understand and learn the culture and see what's important. Um, I think that's a big part of traveling for me, at least. I like to travel solo because I feel like a lot of the time you can kind of get in a little bit easier. Usually people have more, you know, they have space for one extra person in the car to be able to crash and stay the night. Um, and that that was one of the things that I really like about the beginning of this book is just how quickly he's able to really get in with the culture and get in with the tour guide and go visit. Um, so yeah, I'm glad that you had brought that up. He, he pays a cost for it though. I mean, there, there's, there's some initiation uh, yeah. that he has to go through. Uh, and the, the last chapter, uh, he talks about this hat, this Borolino hat, right? He's talking to this character, uh, Didier. Didier would be the pronunciation, I believe. He's a Frenchman. Didier. Uh, he's a sort of flaneur. He's a very flamboyant uh, individual, kind of uh, decadent. Um, brilliant right like very 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 smart uh very cultured uh but completely like debauched at the same time and he's talking about this borolino hat and how the there's a test to determine whether or not a borolino has an authentic true borolino hat which is to pass it through a wedding ring so the, the hat has to pass through a wedding ring and if it comes out the other side and springs back to its original shape keeps its integrity, in other words, then you know it's a real Borolino. And he has to pass through this, uh, this kind of wedding ring, right? That in some sense weds him to the place, right? Uh, I haven't, re- I'm only up to page 100. I'm, you know, this is for foreshadowing perhaps. But um, I, I, uh, I think that that's an important metaphor, right? Because part of being accepted amongst others Right in different culture, different place, different everything, uh, even clean language, is passing through some initiation. Uh, do, do, have, I'm curious, has anyone had that experience uh, with other cultures, other situations? Like, wh- when have you had to be a Borolino hat, if you will? Like, wh- wh- how- I, I, I felt to answer, it's nice because I can actually thread one through the other. So your first question had touched something for me that I wanted to share, but it it feels enough connected to this great follow-up one. So um, I had had the experience growing up, so I'm from Minnesota, grew up in the the Twin Cities um, during the school year, uh, but always with family, what we call up north. So that's anywhere, Brainerd, Fargo, Boundary Waters, what have you. so I remember as a kid, as, as a sense of place evolved for me. So the city, North Minneapolis, you know, um, growing up in the 60s and 70s was, was oh, okay. So this is, this is where, this is my home. But then what is this other place that happens in this magical thing called summer? So there was this kind of artificial boundary that was created as my head wrapped around a sense of place as a kid that would be that would go from the mundane where there was all this boundary setting and limitations and clean up your room and you live you know you go from one cubicle of a room to a cubicle of a classroom to a you know to the freedom of summer right and so um there was a magical transition for me which gave rise to my desire to travel the world um uh, starting in junior high when I started meeting exchange students and realizing what you can ask your parents to go live away from them for a year. Like that was like my first psychedelic experience was realizing it was possible to be, to be set free of, you know, of all that. But so the dream was launched in me and the interesting place that I, your, your question triggered my memory of this, that um, I began to realize at some point as the culmination towards running away, I mean, it was sort of a running away. I, I broke with my parents' plan for myself and broke with the continuity of a, of a, of a life plot that they approved of and would fund and whatever by this, you know, leaving to Europe the way that I did at 16, that um, just a few years prior to that, the continuity between, oh, wait, home 
and cabin, they're not different. This is an artifice. This is like something made up called, called seasons, summer versus the rest of the year. And, and just imagine, you know, like this is a stretch of my utopian thinking at that age, that if these are artifices, you could theoretically make up a life in which, you know, it was all, so to speak, cabin geography or magical space time. So in this book, um, I was driven to, to, to head far away out of a sense of like wonder. I had freedom, but it was a sort of escape for me as well. He's escaping in some, in some sense. And so the, um, the place that I reached to, I was as new there as he was in India. So I was feeling these parallels and there was this process. I mean, the passing through of a ring, maybe the metaphor is being stretched too far, but when you're young and malleable and your identity, you don't have a lot to defend and you're eager to, to merge and meld and your brain is still very open to absorb the language. I, I feel like it was a painless passing through the ring of my person to emerge on the other side as a, as you know, for a year or so, a German speaking, you know, young person, what have you, you know, a sculptor's apprentice or whatever my story was. But he, we each had our different motivations to surrender to being changed in the way that this metaphor of passing through a ring would. And so it's just very touching for me that, that you bring up both of those points because they were also formative for me when I was reading the story. Yeah. Well, I can relate a little bit about uh, transition from the familiar. Um, I was here in uh, California growing up in the suburbs for all my formative years up until a few days before my senior year of high school. And that family crisis precipitated a quick move to another land. And so on the day before, um, uh, I landed in um, a place that I experienced a pretty significant cultural shock. And um, so when I signed up in Fort Worth, Texas for my first day of school, I uh, felt like I was a stranger. And even though I reflects my parochial attitudes in some way, moving from California to uh, a Texas community um, reminded me not just of the shock, um, but what you said, Marco, about going through that uh, initiation process. Um, the neighbors and the kids from the school and their kind of Southern hospitality mode definitely came to check out the California kid. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, you know, a lot of questions ensued. Um, I got to learn how to tap dance around. Are you a Yankee? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think the initiation that one of the ones that comes to mind for me actually um, comes along with the fact that um, I was just under, by uh, about a year, the legal drinking age in Texas, and where it was easy in my high school to get marijuana, cocaine, LSD on campus, it was so humiliating to get beer, you know, from an adult at the 7-Eleven, we just never drank. <laughs> but there was a great culture of drinking, you know, there in West Fort Worth, and so within a week I had a fake ID and was literally going to bars and <laughs> clubs and, and, and discos, which I could never have imagined, you know, for going to for many years and a whole different, different kind of world. Um, they were a little behind the times um, era wise. And so Saturday night fever was super popular. And so there were real, real live discos and, and so forth. And I, I, I can, you know, from thinking along this line, I had to adapt and sort of, um, in that way, but that's about as foreign a country as I've spent a great deal of time in. Did you end up feeling accepted? I, I did. Um, it took a while, but it actually took me moving um, to an even more interesting and desolate place, and that was Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> Isn't that where George Bush is from? Uh, the, George a little bit south. He, they live in Odessa Midland, that area, um, where the high school football teams are superior. <laughs> and uh, in, uh, I just picked because my mother was desperate to get me out of the house I just picked out of a book of the colleges I could go to and it turned out to be Texas Tech she signed me up which is the nearest towns are level land and mule shoes so it's this flat plain and um, 
that I actually found a lot of acceptance because all the kids were also, you know, dislocated from their cliques and their family and home. And so it was easier to find oneself being amongst a bunch of other people who were adapting. It kind of reminds me of that bar scene with the expatriates all sitting around in Shantaram. Beautiful. It's funny, this conversation, I'm just sitting here thinking like, uh, this will tell you something about me. I grew up having moved so many times and again and again and again, and I had to become so ultra malleable that I didn't even notice that he was like, that this was even a possibility that that would be hard to do. That sounds so dumb, but I think it's something that I need to accept about myself. Is that it's, Actually, my struggle has not been to become malleable in other cultures. It's more been like to kind of become more rigid or something. Yeah. Like... Uh, define myself better so instead of constantly going through every ring uh as a hat uh just kind of becoming a plumper hat and sort of making it harder to get through it in a way it's i don't know really what i'm saying but i think it's kind of notable that i did not even notice that <laughs> um wow anyway it's neither here nor there but no totally um, yeah, I mean, I went off to Paris, yeah, yeah like, against my, in, well, as my parents, they were dismayed who I was going with, too, but um, I went off to Paris at 22, it never even occurred to me that I wouldn't fit in, like, of course I'll fit in, I fit in anywhere I go, but it's kind of ridiculous in a funny way, I don't know. Could you envision yourself sitting around the table with the, that gang of ex expatriates? And oh, I'm so there. <laughs> totally like that's why it didn't even occur to me that that would be a hard thing to do that's so weird but yeah anyway awesome. thank you for opening my eyes to that like oh wow that's really odd hmm. in addition to anyone inclining to chime in on these two great questions from marco um, the, the next question, if I was to bring one from my side, was just let's take the guesswork out, and I'd just be curious to know from chapters one or or two, roughly, you know, keeping it kind of um, in harmony with just beginning the book, just what is um, what's really hitting home for people? What feels juicy to to volunteer to the group as a point of departure for what that maybe touches for all of us? One of the things that jumped out to me, and I don't remember where that was in the first 100 pages, I've gotten to 100 pages, was he talked about how to make it work in Bombay that he had to come from sort of an intuitive place, not a rational place. Hmm. And um, I'm not exactly sure why, but that really, that stayed with me. You know, I've been thinking about it since. Uh, and I remember when I was younger traveling that um, that it often felt like a whole flow, um, synchronistic kind of experience, you know. Mm. And, and also if I was alone, you know. Hmm. And I notice now if I travel and I'm with a partner or whoever, it, it's, it's not as easy to access that, that flow, that sort of synchronicitous thing that happens. Anyway, that was one of the things that jumped out at me about it, the early part. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. That kind of jumped out to me, too, because, again, finding the flow of being an individual and him just kind of trying to figure everything out, not knowing anything. That's kind of how I do my vacations, how I prefer to do my trips and my traveling, is just not knowing what the next is going to be in Rebecca. I love what you said because I'm kind of like that too. I feel like I'm in a constant state of initiation. And when I'm not, then I'm like, oh, this is too comfortable. I need to find something new again. Um, and like always hoping that uh, that I'll be accepted, but it's never really a huge worry that I have. You know, I, I, I don't know. I guess I'm just a lot like you in that aspect that I just never really think like, will I be accepted? And I, I like the initiation phase. I like to kind of earn my place and, um, 
you know, really have that connection, that emotional connection with other people where they want to um, allow you to dive deeper, jump down the rabbit hole a little bit farther, I guess. So, yeah. Nice. Um, thanks, Jamie. It's really awesome to hear. <laughs> uh, it's fun. And um, I wanted to share a little bit about what jumped out at me. I mean, first of all, with the first two questions, uh, I definitely could relate right away because uh, I don't know how much David has shared, but for a, a better portion of a decade, he and I would um, travel to places, not exactly running away from uh, escaping from prison for heavy crimes, but... <laughs> that, she, that she was aware of anyway. <laughs> But uh, just moving to new cultures and uh, not just moving through those cultures as a tourist, but really settling in. And so the moment from the book, that from the beginning of the book, I've been now may not remember what happened in which chapter, but I remember very vividly kind of a really cool um, foreshadowing in the opening scene that stuck with me when. Um, uh, the main character, is, before he even became Lin, is uh, uh, just uh, driving uh, or riding uh, from the airport. And uh, for the first time, he is inhaling the smells and the, hearing the, the sounds and looking out the window. Um, as uh, the buildings uh, of the city, like from the um, kind of more modern um, airport buildings, uh, transitioned more towards slum looking areas uh, he could see a guy uh, from the window who looked to your European he looked like a foreigner and uh, he just looked like he was just there in a slum with the loincloth and feeling perfectly comfortable like he just stood there stretching and uh, yawning and looking around and look feeling completely at home and it felt like such a deep image on so many levels. First of all, kind of a great foreshadowing from our main character himself being in the slums and feeling quite at home there and being friends and fitting in with the community, um, finding not just uh, speaking the actual language, but like speaking the same language with the people who are from such a different culture. But it also brought up so many of my own memories of... Um, moving into communities which were not necessarily touristy. I haven't been to India yet, I haven't visited the slums, but we've lived in um, all kinds of different areas which um, uh, not, not very often tourists would be living in. And uh, it felt great to kind of remember some of that and kind of feel what it was like to learn to speak enough Thai language to get around through areas where nobody spoke English. And I could only put together a few sentences in Thai and I had to carry a little dictionary with me. Or um, in Brazil, we lived in all kinds of um, situations and <laughs> places where not a whole lot of tourists go. And uh, it was really just a, such an amazing journey. Um, so definitely I can imagine myself also at the table with all the expats because that's for a decade. Um, a lot of the people we hung out with were not tourists, but expats. People who were like just settled in into a new culture and call it their home, but always to some degree miss their home and um, find balance with, the, with both. <laughs> But but to be clear, these are not mere expats. They're 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 also uh, um, you know involved in some pretty shady stuff, right? Uh, and I, 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 there's something that to me that's a little bit intimidating uh, about uh, the characters, you know, in 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 the book. I I don't you know I don't have a I'm not a that I'm aware of a criminal. I, I don't. You know, I'm, I'm generally follow the rules as far as like society goes in terms of like things like you know fighting and stealing and uh, dealing drugs and prostitution, like all these things that are part of the world of uh, Bombay in which the character is you know finds himself. And you know, clearly that's part of his life history as well. I mean, he's escaping prison because he was uh, a bank robber and so like he's not just in a world but he's like in an underworld 
and uh, and that you know for for somebody like me, I grew up in a nice suburban house with a you know a good family. I did you know I didn't I, I didn't kind of go down that path, uh, and so um, although I mean when I was in Nicaragua and El Salvador, I, that was part of the landscape as well in different ways, and like I interacted with that in in some ways, but. Um, I find that one of the intimidating things actually about the book. And if I'm just giving my first impressions of it, it's that I'm, I'm almost putting like imagining whether or not I could even put myself in the shoes of somebody like uh, this character, Lynn, um, who, you know, has, is, is really like on the edge of things, you know, uh, he's, he's really outside of everything. Uh, and, and in some ways that's part of what's driving him too. Like he, part of his initiation is he has to surrender to the place. Uh, and he has this interesting conversation with Carla, the woman that he's fallen in love with, uh, I think toward the, maybe in page 90 or 91 or somewhere around there where she's, uh, t- where, where he's, um, he's telling her that he got invited by Prabha, Prabhakar to visit Prabhakar's family's village in, uh, in a more rural part uh, of India and part, it seems like he does, he's, there's a bit of a dilemma. Should he say yes or no? Because saying yes is in some way to, to really put himself out there, to really kind of give himself over uh, to, his, to his host, to the country. To, and, and there's something that, I mean, it's almost inevitable that he does. Of course, the book wouldn't exist if he, if he hadn't followed that, that, those impulses. But I think that... Um, Part of the scary thing for me, just as an initial reaction to it, is like how that, that surrendering can take a life of its own. And those synchronicities start kind of lining up to lead you into a world that you may never have even imagined you could possibly be in. Sure. Um, I, that, that all lands. And, and I don't know if it's just having traveled more or having traveled in more stranger places, perhaps, but there is... Um, there is this um, there is this reality that depending on the city in India was very much this way. It didn't um, configurations of of expats and tourists and locals meeting up didn't happen in the same way that it necessarily happens. I mean, in Europe, depending on how much you're willing to pay for a cafe and in which part of town you're willing to go, you can almost self select for echelons um, or sort of the the clientele to be kind of self-selecting for a certain level of either elegance or funkiness or, you know, edginess or what have you. It's, you can almost kind of, you can almost kind of know uh, who you'll be hanging with. India was not so much that way. And so I think um, given the truth of everything that you're saying and, and um, the book will explore this further. I think one of the interesting dynamics um, is that, uh, his life story in India was a weaving, uh, was his thread in, in the weave of the plot passed through a variety of cult, of cultures and, and with an incredible fluidity um, that, um, that sort of gives us the opportunity to feel into, you know, um, exactly these kind of either exciting or uncomfortable or adventuresome edges for ourselves. I mean, this place where they're all hanging out, um, you know, I, you know, Bombay was my city in India uh, when Pune wasn't. So it was between Bombay and Pune that my life kind of went back and forth with a few months up in Kashmir. And, and so I can just say that, you know, you had that feeling um, that you at one group of table would be the the German summer tourists and the other table could have definitely been, you know, uh, underworld kingpins trying to pick up foreign girls. And then at another table, there might have been a wedding party that had saved for three years to afford a casual cocktail per se. So I just, uh, it's a little, it, my experience was that it was, it was quite fluid relative to the opportunity it provided to rub shoulders with either exciting or, or dangerous elements. I'll just, just to take it out a little further though, uh, just to push it a little further. I mean, he ends up in a place where, where children are being traded for um, sex, for work, a slave house, right? The, are you there slave, already in your first read? Yes. Right there in the first hundred pages? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. there. Uh, the, his first, his initial exposure to that. And, mm. and part of the thing, part of what he comes to face is like that, like it's horrendous, it's horrific mm-hmm. and he can't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and one of the things I think he's surrendering to is the fact that he can't do anything about it. Mm. Uh, and nonetheless has to give himself over to that, to that reality in some way. Like that, there's some, to me, that's where it starts. It gets uncomfortable there for me, you know, like, like, geez, if I was in that situation, right. What does it say about me that I could witness that and sort of move on, you know, just yeah. go on to my next occasion, the, the next drink, you know, at the bar with the, the expats. I mean, there, I, I think that this weighs on, uh, on him. I mean, he wouldn't have written about it. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I don't know where that goes exactly, but, uh, but it, it See, to me, it, it just brings it to more of a sort of moral um, core, you know, because mm. it, it's a, uh, I, I don't doubt that he's, that that's real and that, that, that he really saw that uh, and that that still is the case. Uh, mm. And um, so anyway, I, like I said, I don't know exactly where that goes other than that. I want to high, like, I want to bring it to that level that, you know, it's not just kind of different crowds. I mean, some of this is like very, you know, horrific stuff that he's talking about. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, he is like somebody that becomes, I don't know his whole story. I haven't read the rest of the book, but he becomes uh, part of the world. Like he really becomes part of the fabric of that world as a member of the, the mafia. Right. So in some way complicit, right. In that whole set of relationships that's doing these horrific things. Um, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, that, that seems to me significant. Yep. Um, I'm so yeah, and I'd support, you, I'd support you to wait and wait and see how these moral questions get parsed as you move further into it, because then there's the subcultures with it, within this gray to black zone that he moved within who had very specific boundaries about what quote unquote crime, you know, they would, they would represent and why that was okay and what wasn't. And so this will be explored further. We won't miss it. You won't miss a chance to get to get either more into that or more comfortable or uncomfortable. <laughs> well, but another part of that too is the cultural thing. I mean, part of what Prab Prabhakar was that how you say his name? Prab- Prabhaka. Prabhaka. Mm-hmm. Prabhaka was talking about was was saying to him, "These kids are the lucky kids. These are the kids that are coming from places that were worse." And. Um, as we're talking about this, as horrific as it, as the slavery thing is, is on the other hand, you know, there's this there's this relative situation of having to, you know, it's sort of like, um, you know, just always the issue of moving into other cultures with our values and sort of not necessarily considering the whole context. Um, anyway, I, yeah, yeah, that was that was a whole fascinating scene, and just even, you know, walking down that little alley where he has to put his feet against the wall so he's not stepping in the crap in the middle and the, anyway it was uh it was fascinating and so descriptive uh, yeah I, I love going into that kind of immersion experience and i've always historically had this this maybe scary facility at at um compartmentalizing like say the slavery part of it um Anyway, I'm just sort of throwing that out there. And something I recognize about myself. It's like a story rather than real or something. Mm. Anyway, yeah. Who else here has um, been to India? Rebecca, I forget whether you've been. I never have. Mm -hmm. Uh -uh. I I feel like I have now twice, but. (laughs) Right, 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 right. A thorough visit. But I think it's so interesting that point that you brought up, Marco, um, as it's just like, I mean, it's obviously a theme that comes up again, um, but I think, um, for me, it's such a, uh, a way of looking at the assumptions that I make as a Westerner that I, that I come from this very specific um, background and uh, viewpoint on things such as child slavery. But as Pam pointed out, yeah, those are actually the lucky ones. If you look at it in terms of the way that Prabhaka is looking at it, like you're looking at such a different cultural context that it's, um, it's, it's puzzling and it's huge and it's um, it, it helps me become ever more compassionate. I think to, to be shown that 
um, that sort of need to understand the way that other people see the world in such a in such a vastly different way than we see that um, because we have a very specific uh, way of looking at it. It's by Western standards totally wrong, and and by super crowded um, country you know stuff happens there are there are these tragedies that happen floods and monsoons and all this other stuff that I'm like wow that brings up so many challenging questions i think it's it's a really interesting thing that we'll probably bring up again and again as we go through this book yeah for sure i, I think one other thing to that I wanted to say. So I, um, I have to watch more closely the relationship between a hundred pages because I had that whole piece happening a bit later and I'll, I'll have to uh, track that a bit closely for the focus of each call. But um, it was for me more specifically the fact that this, this cafe, this bar, this meeting point, point was a sort of a nexus of possibility for him to make decisions on what he wanted to explore. There were relationships, um, there were potential intimacies, there were potential um, dealings, you know, this was sort of the, um, the behind the scenes in a sense to authoring his life in India where he'd sort of gather with a, a growing group of acquaintances and try to get a, get a feel for how he would orient based on who they were and what they learned and how they were getting by and all that. So, um, uh, you're right. I mean, there was, you know, sort of, this was the place, this is the place that you could come back to, to process and to reflect and then to choose again. And India offered, you know, this, this outrageous um, diversity in a sense, just outside one degree of separation from any choice, any choice, that, thanks, sweetheart, any choice he might make. Uh, about what was either interesting for him or necessary for him or what called him. And um, some of these lessons, you know, and we're just getting into them, but some of them were absolutely, you know, of and beyond the nature of the, you know, the vulnerability you're mentioning, Marco, you know, this sort of, you know, abhorrent and shocking and, you know, um, you know, the, he touches, touches all of that. And I can just say from the moment you land uh, at the airport in that country, the minute you step outside in your world of everything being handled, especially if you tend to be someone who wants to backpack it or rickshaw it or whatever, I, you know, there could be rarely a more stark, and I've done Central and South America and I've lived in South Africa and lived in crazy places in Southeast Asia and, you know, far from you know, Siberia, et cetera, et cetera. But this, uh, this thing about arriving in India and being transitioning from the, sort of the, the structures and safe references of sort of uh, a well-mannered European life to, you know, slowly getting through customs and grabbing your bag and then the onslaught, you know, times a thousand of anything you've ever been hit with for taxi drivers. And, you know, you realize that you could make or break this person's, you know, entire month of feeding their family with one ride somewhere. And then you get outside the front door because you're going to go for the, the cheaper bus or the cheaper taxi or what have you. And then literally there are thousands of people who survive by camping out outside the door and hoping for that one random dollar once a month, et cetera, et cetera. And so now you're in sort of post-apocalyptic, you know, introduction, which is, as Shantaram will keep illustrating, mixed with smiles and generosity of spirit. And, and uh, you know, so in any case, just, just further chiming in on that. So, so is there something special about India, distinct then? I mean, you, you seem to be suggesting that there is. Uh, the author suggests that there is, that there's something special about this particular place uh, that changes the quality of the people there, changes the quality of the experience there. And, I mean, I'll, I'll, just to add one little kind of subtlety to that, I have found from personal experience that people in, in poverty are friendlier. And they are more open, and they are happier, uh, e and and that coexists with the the suffering and the um, the tragedy, you know, that 
is atten- attendant to poverty at, at the same time. That, I mean, that's part of like the paradox of it is that, um, is that you, it's act, the, the freedom and the joy that he talks about and the love that, that he talks about. I've found that to be very real uh, in, in those situations, but there's also something specific he seems to be saying about, about India. And I, have, I haven't been there, but I'm, I'm imagining it as well. And you seem to be suggesting the same. Um, I, it may be, you know, it may be parsing subtleties, but with my sampling of living, you know, a couple of years here, a couple of years there, and then India being one of the more profound um, spots, you know, where, where I did, I did some time, serious time. I think what's interesting, I always attribute it to, I always attribute it to the overarching, um, you know, um, I guess you could say religious or the, what's the word, the, the, paradigmatic, these overarching paradigms that largely, I guess, from religion, but, you know, a sense of um, a a culture that has deeply ingrained within it um, a really almost psychedelic transcendence of the importance of the single individual. I mean, you can, you can talk about Central America and South America, which you have, um, unless you're talking about, you know, indigenous cultures, you're talking about the, the invasion of Judeo-Christian, you know, the, the inflicted, you know, transition to Judeo-Christian, you know, worldview, good and evil, us and them, this life, one life, and then an afterlife if you do it right and all that goes with that. Uh, India is is just, you know, unhinged. You've got, you know, the pantheon of, of gods, as you know. You have the endless incarnations to, to get anywhere. You know, you think the, the Tibetans have a, have a fairly odorous roadmap <laughs> to, to put before the, the would-be evolving soul, but India is like it's... It's so vast. And so I think the people tend to live in a, in a little bit more of a suspended state. You know, I just remember hurrying one day in, in a rickshaw to get somewhere in Pune. And I was like, you know, do you, you know, do you know where, you know, Kardi Wardi 27 is a job, Baba, no problem that one night, you know, so we get like 15, 20 minutes into this journey. And then he's stopping every other rickshaw asking where is, and then he's stopping another one to, to literally suck gas out of one take and blow it into his or whatever. At some point it just said, you know, you know, you don't know it. I said the time. Oh, Papa, don't worry. This lifetime, next lifetime, one lifetime, don't worry. You will get there. A jolly good fellow like yourself never missed to make his place this lifetime or next lifetime. You know, and so, um, and I didn't exactly encounter that, you know, in um, in Central and South America, um, exactly in the same flavor in Southeast Asia. Certainly not in Soweto. Uh, so yeah, there's some. There's definitely something unique there. Who else? Uh, f- these first hundred pages. What else? Well, what struck me um, in the first part was his um, declarations of love. You know, falling in love with um, Prabhakar and um, recognizing, you know, that later on he had fallen in love with him. And in regards to um, that image with the uh, child slave market. Um, I don't remember which of the characters posed the statement or the question that really hit me um, when it was asked, are you able to still love the world with what you've seen or what you're seeing? And um, for some reason, that resonated in a way that I found curious and disturbing. And in that intensification of life, the, the, the hyper vividness of life and uh, in all its facets that was being described as India, um, the world in its you know richness and poorness and and beauty and horror uh, as such, and then the choice: do I love this? Do I hate it? But those extremes were right there um, presented, and I was thinking, you know, reflecting on that, and have been ever since I came across that question and that passage. Mm. Indeed. Indeed, indeed. I was wondering if anyone else, um, if if I'm not cutting in too quick, you guys wave me down if you want to respond to the last question. But another question I was carrying into this first meeting was, was anyone else surprised by, or when you reflect now, what do you feel about 
how rapidly you were drawn into um, liking this anti-hero hero. I mean, you, I mean, I think we'd all agree if we just did a mental experiment that we wouldn't like everyone escaping tomorrow from their respective prisons and, you know, having to learn through one-on-one -on -one relationships with all of these escapees, whether they are in their heart of hearts as potentially as noble as Lynn will eventually, you know, maybe reveal himself to be. But I was just immediately taken by him. I was longing for, for these guys on the roof to make it out. I was just, you know, nail biting as they're, you know, scaling this wall with a electrical cord or what have you. You know, I was, I was just right in there with them um, in a way that I wasn't. I mean, there's, we're presented a bunch of modern sort of entertainment, you know, anti-heroes as well. You've got, you know, Mr. Breaking Bad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> making making meth to pay for his own chemotherapy or, or whatever you know a little a little trickier by by the end of that season to love him and follow him but i think one of the things that without uh, this will be the art of talking about this for those of us who have read the whole thing um but um there's something about um this particular character the way he's crafted the way the writing um carries carries him within a rich context that has me has me always pulling for him. And it started very, very early for me. And I was curious if that was everyone's experience. Well, I can say that I'm surprised at how much I guess I feel identified already. And it happened very quickly in the case that his interactions with uh, some of the characters, some we haven't gotten to in the first hundred pages yet. Already I would put aside the book because I could tell I was identifying so strongly that the next encounter was edging me out. I'd have to wait to come back. And so I've been amazed at how I've kind of been drawn in as the character through his heart, through his eyes as such. Um, so as maybe not pulling for, but almost like they sucked me inside the character's skin, I guess I'd say that. Or I've let myself go there. For me, I was actually, it felt like there was a, almost a contradiction. Here's a guy who's running from the law, he's in survival mode, um, you know, security issues, all of that stuff, and yet, he his heart opens easily to people and uh that but you know beginning with Prabhakar or however you say that and i was kind of really struck by that um and touched by that it was my heart opened to him because of the way that he was with with Prabhakar. Mm -hmm. he's very generous too in his descriptions of people uh, like as a, you know, we have a character, right? That he's drawing, the author is drawing. And so the author gives that character life and invests that character with details and with voice, uh, with, um, you know, animation, animates that, that character. And I mean, one of the things that I find that I, I, I'm pulling for or that I'm feeling identified with or that I'm resonant with in, in, uh, in Lynn as a avatar, if you will, for the for the author, is how generous he is in his in the way that he brings other people to life. Uh, like I could hear Pravakar talking. Like even though I've never been there, his voice is so distinct. Uh, you're actually David. You just gave a great impression. I think of the kind you know, like just that that like how much how much life energy comes through. Uh, it really is. Um, um, it's embodied in the artistry, I think, of, of, of the writing. Uh, and, and he does that, especially for Prabhakar, I found. Uh, but there's also, he does it for others as well. Didier as well, that French, uh, the Frenchman. Uh, and certainly Carla, although she's a darker and, you know, I think we're getting a slower introduction to her in some way. Uh, like she's more of an elusive, more of a um, mysterious uh, type figure. And... In some way, I don't know the story, but she, he seems to be following his, the thread of his love uh, for her. And that love is, becomes m intermingled with a love of the place, of India, the people. Uh, and so part of, I think, yeah, what 
what I feel like I'm, where I feel like I really resonate with him is, is just in how much love he, love and life he gives to the people around him. I think it's really beautiful. Mm-hmm. He loves the characters. He's able to take all of these characters, these interesting backgrounds and you love even, you know, did you, you, I love them. You know, I already love them because of the way that he, the way that he loves them and the way he describes them. If I could do a quick plug, which is an odd sidebar, especially among, you know, literature purists for, if not during, but after you do your first read through the physical book, actually treating yourself to the audio version. Um, there's a preeminent Australian uh, actor uh, doing the reading. I mean, a, a gentleman of really high stature who runs in a well-recognized uh, repertoire theater in, in um, I think, Sydney. Um, and they got him for this book, and he just he does in, an incredible job of animating many of the characters. So it's one voice. It's not a whole, you know, audio story. But it's, it's worth it just for um, double-checking your fantasy against a really wonderful theatrical version. And, and, and um, Probaka, which is the soft R of the Australian, you know, they kind of tend to lean on that. But um, Pro- Probaka is Probaka, Probaka is how they, they tended to pronounce it, but um, uh, is especially endearing <laughs> with the particular um, pattern accent that he's been granted. And I, I don't know here, who here has listened to the audio book, but it, it's a treat. <laughs> I give it a huge thumbs up too. <laughs> it's, it really, especially since it was my second time through the book, to hear the way that he just delineates each character so beautifully and and he's so consistent with each voice i don't know how he did that um amazing right yeah it's it's a massive job that he did (laughs) Um, i need to excuse myself i'm sorry that was all the time i had tonight but i just want to say goodbye thank you i'll see you next week wonderful rebecca thank you bye bye Well, should we start wrapping up, David? Yeah. And maybe yeah. Talk, talk in logistics or any, any final. Please. We'll lead us into that if you would, Michael. Yeah. Well, I mean, very logistics are very simple. Uh, we can reconvene on the same Zoom line next week, uh, same time. Anybody who's seeing this or hearing this, um, who uh, does not know, you know, where to sign up, uh, you can go to cosmos.coop. And uh, on the homepage there, there's a, a, a news item uh, that's an invitation to sign up. We're, this is the first conversation of nine total, and we're gonna, going to be doing one weekly uh, for the next couple of months or so. Uh, it's possible also, David, we'll have to talk about this, but that we do uh, a couple of meetings in person uh, for folks who are local. Um, there's a meetup group that I set up. I haven't posted anything to it yet, but already a few people have signed up. And so potentially we'll get to meet them and maybe we'll work out the technology link and, uh, you know, have uh, a sort of hybrid type of, type of mm-hmm. online meeting. Cool. Uh, and then we have the forum, uh, which I know that, uh, you know, there's so much to do and there's so much to respond to from email to social media to everything else. Uh, so the forum is really there to be a, just a place where uh, we can engage in asynchronous uh, reflections or discussions uh, or sharing of resources or ideas or tidbits, what, really whatever we want to use that space for. There's no obligation to, to, to use it, um, but it, it's, all, it's been important for me uh, in the course of this whole project, the, this reading group, the other reading groups, to have a dedicated place, to have a different place, a separate place, from the kind of social media milieu and stew, even though if we did a Facebook group or what have you, there'd be more people, it would be a lot more active. Uh, but I have found having done that, that, um, that the quality is not necessarily the intentionality or the sense of it being something different or a different place, like a different space that you would go to is not, is not quite there. And so it gets just kind of mixed into everything else. Uh, and so, um, I think you know we'll 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 post some uh, some questions or some kind of topics there, and you know if you feel drawn to if you feel actually actually moved by a question to you know, read somebody's responses to it or add your own, um, but uh, I think that that forms a nice supplement to these in-person conversations, which 
um, you know, have a different quality to them because we're together in the same time, uh, if in different places, but connected virtually. And we really get to see each other and hear each other. And I felt so, I felt very um, enriched. I felt my experience of the book very enriched by hearing all of your voices. Uh, so I'm just glad that you, that you showed up. And, um, and if others want to jump in, in subsequent calls, uh, you are completely welcome to do that. This, this particular group, we're offering it as a, a free um, you know, introduction, if you will, to these, you know, to these reading groups. Um, but if you're able to, and if you'd like to, we, uh, you, you can give a donation. This is gonna support our cooperative organization to keep on doing these, these events. And you can find that information at cosmos.coop as well. Um, but really, uh, I mean, I, I'm just so glad that we've been able to have this conversation that we can have a few more and go even deeper in, in uh, as we go deeper into the book, as we surrender uh, to, this, to this place and space that the book opens up for us. And I thank you, David, for, um, for bringing it uh, to, to my attention and for you know, kind of initiating it and uh, bringing your personal experience, your, you know, your, your, your own love uh, that is evident um, to, um, to this space. And uh, I'll let, let you have any final words that you'd like to have. I think that covers it in terms of logistics, unless anybody else has questions. Yeah. That's perfect. Um, Pam and Paul, because I know everyone else here, I get a chance to lavish just a little bit of attention back in your direction. It's so nice to meet both of you and um, really um, welcoming this chance to make some new friends here um, you know, and get to know you guys more. And it's already been rich seeing the book a little bit through your eyes and reflections here in the first chapter. So, I mean, what a, what a journey forward. And to know, um, at least in your case, Paul, I forget with you, Pam, um, the second book, is floating out there. So this is just sort of a, the ruse to get a commitment to the sequel. So I, I look forward to hopefully um, sharing a, a journey uh, all the way through to the second book where I can be authentically, you know, chapter by chapter in a new discovery with you rather than just sort of going deeper with something I've read before. So um, great to meet you both and, and really glad that you've made the time to be here and, and looking forward to sharing this uh, this time together, this sort of the heartbeats of this read uh, week by week. Um, so thank you very much. Maybe you're like our Prabhakar. Uh, you're our guide. Yeah, 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 that's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Bombay guide, very excellent. First number one Bombay guide, that one I am. All Bombay, I know it well. You want to see everything. And exactly where you find most of it, and then more everything you want. That <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. Hey, well. thank you guys so much for for creating this and holding space and all of it. It's, it's really, it's really lovely. Cool. All right. Well, I guess that's a wrap. It's a wrap. Well done, great. guys. Thank you. Bye, Sweet evening, everyone. Yeah.